Hello, Endeavor here. So tonight I'm here with a guest, Keith Woods, and uh, he's a new rising star in the dissident right, right wing sphere here on YouTube. And he's made a lot of really interesting videos, um, many of which that I've uh, have made me think quite a bit about a lot of the problems we kind of discuss online. And uh, is uh, he said a lot of things that I really agree with. So I guess for anyone who hasn't heard of Keith yet, uh, what, what do you do with your channel? Uh, I guess it's a it's a mix of a combination of things. I kind of set it up more as a as a philosophy channel, and I kind of I got drawn got drawn more and more into sort of uh, nationalism or white identity or whatever you might want to call it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of just make videos about whatever interests me. I mean, sometimes I'm talking about immigration, sometimes I'm talking about the the Irish issue. Sometimes, like lately, I've been doing quite a bit of. Uh, Posts about like neoliberalism and capitalist economics and stuff. So, yeah, kind of just whatever happens to interest me. But usually from the standpoint of of white identity, of sort of trying to turn around the the mess that European people are in, trying to find a way out of this I guess problem that we all agree on, this sort of postmodern quagmire or whatever you might want to call it. Yeah. So um, speaking of your videos about neo neoliberalism, the most recent ones, they're the ones that uh, I really agree with a lot that you said, especially in the video, the idiot nationalist that you titled it. Um, now, I might be a bit less critical of uh, of other guys in our, in our sphere, but uh, you said a lot that I think a lot of people do need to hear. And um, I titled this green beyond nationalism, because I do think that um, there's a lot of we have this this idea of this political divide today that it's globalism versus nationalism and i think that's true to an extent in that the political the dominant political force is one called globalism and that is like the real uh that is the real consensus that is what's being pushed by the so-called left and the so-called right in as they exist in these uh national parliaments um but i feel like the and i feel like the response you can be called nationalism in a way because it is um, a lot more focused on the good of the of the uh, native populations rather than the global economy. But at the same time, I don't know if it's entirely an accurate phrase because I feel like in a globalized world, because I use the phrase globalization as kind of a neutral and globalism as a specific ideology, which I oppose in a kind of a more globalized world. Um, the response to globalism does have to be global also. So I guess what were some of the arguments that you've made recently and what would be some of your criticisms of, uh, I guess, people in our, in the right that maybe you feel are kind of missing the point on a lot of things? Well, I mean, you know, I'm sympathetic to those people because it's not long ago I did have similar opinions, but I mean, when you're looking for, for answers and you're looking for ways out of this ethnic nationalism of the you know the kind of petty nationalism people would talk about uh you know where people get excited about you know based poland or based based hungarian prime minister or whatever it's it's a little bit misleading you know it's kind of a it's kind of a false victory because firstly a problem is that i find especially in my own country is that people tend to attach certain ideas to that that in the long run aren't actually coherent alongside values of of racialism or nationalism at all so that you know what passes for nationalism tends to be just a form of of racist conservatism uh, but the other the other thing is that you know as you said yourself you can't really just choose to leave globalism and this is what you find with a lot of nationalists is just like we'll uh, you know we'll take power and uh, we'll just have a nationalist state and will we'll remove the, the foreign globalist influence or whatever. But I mean, that's, that's at best, I think you can maybe put it off by a few years, but even these countries, people get excited about, you know, they, they just end up being, being pawns for, for an American empire to become pawns in, in a, a NATO Western empire. And you just find with these, these uh, sort of conservative nationalists, oftentimes as people that are more maybe reactionary, uh, they don't tend to look at things as structurally. I don't want to keep having a go at them. Um, but they won't look at maybe the structural issues that are at play and the, the loss of identity we see. And it's one of those things, when you see this happening 
uh, across the world when you see it happening like this isn't confined to a handful of countries that made bad political decisions or something i mean even in asia now there's talk, even in japan there's talk now of of uh, guest worker programs and they're going to start bringing in lots of immigrants as guest workers and people say well you know they're not going to make them citizens it's not comparable at all to what's happened to european countries but in another sense this is just kind of the the first step on kind of a, a linear path and we just happen to be we we're, we're further down that linear path but it does seem that there's uh there's a logic to globalization that any countries that enter into it follow and from my perspective regardless of if you have a, a leader or a political party that signals nationalist ideas if your economy and your culture is completely determined by globalized forces if there's only there's only a there's only limited success you can have with having a a, a government that's sort of overtly nationalistic yeah because you had mentioned kind of the petty nationalism now i guess for what uh people would uh, for anyone that doesn't know i mean i i want to make it clear i'm not like counter signaling people who are you know i guess like in our sphere and i don't want to like you know uh, uh, rip someone apart who's generally on the same side as me but what that would mean is kind of um like holding on to older grudges so you know the uh the guy from uh, i don't know uh from Ireland still hates the English or, you know, the guy in Catalonia, he hates the Spanish or something like that. And uh, I guess when it comes to countries like, uh, like you mentioned, like Hungary or Poland that people will often get excited about. I mean, I, I kind of see it, I see it as a small victory. I see but at the same time, people have to also remember that um, the, the attack against what we consider to be Western civilization and European peoples, it is a global attack. And, I think that um, you you were not you're not going to be able to have like this one country that's kind of like cut off from the rest of them, and they preserve a uh, a strong uh, national identity as it would have existed in say nineteen in say nineteen thirty, because the problem you have is uh, like you had mentioned with uh, economic liberalism comes cult, comes social liberalism, and when when you have these countries just under the uh, just under the absolute weight of these massive corporations, unless there's actually a global response to that, a, a pan European response to that, I really don't see how um, you'd actually be able to hold yourself off from that. Because um, you know when when push comes to shove, if the entire if the entire money power of the world is you know uh, leaning on say Hungary. They're going to probably have to give in, unfortunately, and I don't want that to be the case. But um, I think that I guess why I enjoyed a lot of the, your videos was that um, it, it, you questioned a lot of the things like uh, of the economic uh, forces behind w what would be considered, um, I guess, a lot of people call cultural Marxism. But I think it, you'd made the good point that it's actually more cultural neoliberalism, and that's kind of re where the real where the real monster is. So, um, I mean, what, what would you say is like, would people, what, what kind of thoughts, thought evolution do people really kind of need? So in what way do people need to start thinking of it in a different kind of framework than say, you know, a, a nationalist movement in say, um, uh, 1900 would have thought of this? Well, I mean, I, I did a video before actually, it was about, um, there's, these, there's a, a collection of colorized pictures pictures from the start of the 20th century and there's something about them that's that's really appealing i like all that stuff like recolorized world war one photos the documentaries and stuff but i mean when you look at them all of these cultures are like these are genuine cultures these are really worlds unto themselves you know you look at the you know a woman weaving a basket in, in connemara in the west of ireland and then you look at a, a market in in the ottoman empire turkey and these are these are genuinely different worlds or different cultural spaces of different metaphysical understandings of existence of totally different economic systems and ways of life and traditions and different conceptions of time different languages too that's a big one yeah like these are really worlds unto themselves it was a time when like real exploration of the of the world was possible you know you weren't just traveling to another country if you went from the west of ireland to the ottoman empire in a certain sense it was another world but that's that's not that's not possible today um you know one of my favorite philosophers jacques Lull, said that there's no there's no uh, cultural differences anymore there's only sort of 
slight aesthetic differences. There's just differences in progression along this linear path of technique. What, what he calls technique, you could just call economic rationalization. But like this is this is very true to a large extent. I mean, there are there are obviously differences between countries. You know, there's great differences in East Asia and and Western Europe. But you know, in certain important ways, there isn't a huge difference. The the dominant trend across the world is is this economic rationalization now, and it is invading every area of life. Um. So in terms of like where we should be going, I mean, I think we need to find you know the common the common factor that is destroying the things we care about, and I think that any serious analysis of it leads you to think that this is a a deeper structural issue and that this is a kind of linear progression that we're on towards this rationalization that's determined by some kind of internal logic which to a large extent we don't question so the question is what's what's driving that internal logic and i think to a large extent uh as you mentioned economic liberalism driving social liberalism i think to a large extent our economic system now has become this kind of frankenstein's monster it's kind of uh, it's a uh, it's self regenerating and it's 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 of a scale now where it it can to a large extent shape the culture. Uh, there was an economic theorist Carol Polanyi, Polanyi who talked about this concept of of uh, embedded liberalism uh, that up until uh, he wrote in the nineteen forties, but that there was uh, there was embedded economic liberalism where you could have uh, sort of capitalism within one country we'll say and where the markets were subservient to the state but since the early 1970s since things like the Bretton Woods agreement you know the the US uh, leaving the gold standard and then some of the reforms of the 1980s with people like Thatcher and Reagan we have this sort of disembodied liberalism where economic liberalism now is it's it's no longer part of a country's economy now it's it's beyond the state and to a large extent, it's it's shaping the makeup of states to, to suit its own internal logic rather than the other way around. And there is a question of until you deal with that, how are we going to preserve anything we care about? Because, I mean, Brexit's a good example. Like, I don't know what's going to come out of Brexit, but it's, it's, it's conceivable, say, that, you know, if you were to be nationalist on a, say, like a civic nationalist scale, or if you were to put Britain's interests first, I mean, that could conceivably lead them to doing something like, you know, if the EU in, in introduced a financial services tax, which they've been talking about doing for quite a while, and it was Britain that was stopping them doing it, you could have a scenario where, where Britain refuses to introduce that and becomes a hub for, for finance capital in the city of London. So, you know, by behaving in, in, Britain's, in Britain's own interest, by putting Britain first, you could have a scenario where a conservative government would be turning Britain into a, a sort of tax haven for international high finance, who are the same people who are destroying the nation state and destroying traditions across Europe. So there is this kind of paradoxical zero sum game uh, you enter into when, when you have, when you have uh, economic neoliberalism and uh, individual nation states in competition. Yeah, you know, the one thing that I, one kind of small thing that I noticed, but it, it did feel really telling was that um, I mentioned in my most recent video that I used to work at a, I used to be a cook. I used to work at a restaurant and, you know, in my college days, I had done quite a bit of that. And one thing I noticed was that, um, that uh, we had like a fryer in our kitchen and um, we had these like, you know, units for, where you'd put product when I, back in those days when I worked there. I don't still work there. I have a, a respectable job now, but um uh, and they, they would they would make this kind of sound when the thing was done, and they'd make it a sound when the product had been there like too long or something like that. And one thing I, th I found really telling was that when I was in Europe and I was in uh, have uh, in one of these restaurants, I actually heard that exact same sound in the background. Uh, that because it was the exact same model of fryer, exact same model of everything. And uh, when I was in South Africa uh, about almost three years ago now they have the exact same thing. So um, it's this uh, it kind of example of standardization of uh, kind of the global of all these like products. It's just like a very small example of standardization of the global economy, really, that they kind of they've standardized fryers. And of course, you know, things like fast food is something that's been completely standardized. It's, it's global now. It's kind of a, 
I guess like um, neo, the, the neoliberal diet, I, if you if you if you will. Um, but uh, it, it made me think about a lot of um, kind of a, a lot more of the the um, the cultural aspects that kind of come along with that. And you know, when you see things like these big budget um, uh, Marvel movies, I made a video about the Marvel movies or the Star Wars, whatever you want it to be. And you, you see this kind of messaging going into these movies. This is meant for a global audience. So, you know, uh, if they had made um, maybe a subversive film back in 1950, I mean, that would probably only be viewed by maybe people in America, Canada, and maybe Britain, uh, and probably to a lesser extent, maybe some of the other countries, maybe like, I don't know, Australia. But today they, they've kind of created these means of uh, perpetuating uh, what I what I refer to often as globalist culture or neoliberal culture through um, through mass media, and uh, I think that one of the things that the dissident right has been good at is that uh, even though we do consider ourselves to kind of be a nationalistic movement, in many ways it is a global a globalized movement as well because uh, the memes of the dissident right are global. Really, they they're memes that are designed to really be. Um, shared throughout the, I guess, the entire, without, throughout the entire Western world, at least. I mean, you can just think about this conversation alone. I mean, you and I are from completely different countries, we're from uh, two sides of the Atlantic, but, you know, we're having a conversation about uh, this very thing. Um, and I, I think that that really is the battlefield that um, we, we really need to be thinking about because um, it, the, there's... As you as you had mentioned, kind of the the national battlefield. It's still important, but at the same time, your your country only really exists within a globalized world, and uh, what goes on throughout that is gonna uh, is is gonna be what affects every every country in in the entire world. Really, I find. Yeah, that's that's something a little talked about as well. Is that one of the key aspects of technique is universalism. And he uses the example of something like the communication apparatus, as in, you know, if, if you're going to have uh, if you're going to have commercial flights between countries that you need like universal standards for for safety and for uh, the way airports operate and whatnot. And that this kind of uh, applies across the board of, of, of business and uh, international communication. And it's it would be absolutely naive to think that you'd have this. Uh, tend towards uh, standardization and universalism in a uh, political economy and for that not to have reverberations on on the culture but unfortunately uh that's that's an aspect that's that's often left out um but i mean you know there's like i see someone in, in the comments like spurging out like we need solutions now exclamation mark but like i kind of think this is this is one of the problems is that the right is always so so reactive and i think i think one of the main reasons for it, i think it's quite obvious really is like the the demographic question is so pressing that it's like we don't really have time we don't really have 20 or 30 years because you know i mean what's the statistics like in 2066 uh white british people will be a minority in their country and much sooner for for white americans so we're certainly um a part of the political spectrum where uh, there's a serious urgency to this but at the same time uh if you're behaving politically in a in a reactionary way uh not reactionary in, as in the the political ideology of reaction but you know in a reactive way against uh, yeah, yeah, against current events yeah. yeah you're you're always you're you're always still trapped in the paradigm that your enemies have set you're you know you're reacting against what the leftists are doing and you're just jumping to the the opposite side of that logic which is I don't know, being a racist conservative or something, but you, you know, you're still, you're still advancing that dialectic. Um, if you look at, and if you look at some of these reforms, if you look at something like uh, economic neoliberalism, you know, there is this idea that this was sort of a, a natural process and uh, like it was a natural move towards greater individual rights or freedom or something. That's the the mythology that's been about themselves. But I mean, if you look at it, this this began much earlier in sort of the sixties and seventies when uh, these lobby groups came together, funded by Business Roundtable, and started looking very much long term. And it, it's interesting reading some of the stuff. There was all these societies that kind of formed around Friedrich Hayek's work, and they were talking about 
thinking radically and constructing a completely different kind of of economic and and social logic and then sort of targeting elites to to spread it from the top down but they were very much looking long term but i do feel that there's there's a there's an issue with much of the right which is that we're always losing battles because we're always we're always just jumping in head first into sort of traps that the the enemy has has set for us and we're we're always in that sense we're always on the defensive and we're always letting them craft the narrative whereas one thing i see that's a, a potential positive space for us is i do see um like i remember when that sas ad came out recently there was there was all these channels that aren't generally like they're not explicitly nationalist or anything there was like video game channels and like there was a big warhammer 40k channel and they were they were making videos criticizing this and i think we are seeing because we're the only ones offering a substantive critique now of of this process you're seeing that it's kind of starting to to drip into more mainstream culture uh, and I think if there is a space for us now with our small numbers at the moment, while we still build, it is that it is providing that critique and uh, creating a space for for intelligent people that that are disaffected with all of this. Yeah, because I, that I would say is what um, I guess the online sphere has been the most successful at. Because when you look at that SAS ad. Uh, and then you can you, know, you consider maybe like who are some of the biggest nationalist channels on on YouTube like uh, there's um, Red Ice even though they got banned uh, Iconoclast is pretty huge uh, Way of the World but you know most of them don't have uh, that above you know I, I don't think there's any nationalists who have a million subscribers I think if they did they'd probably be banned by now I think James also was banned at about 400k and that was about the highest one that he had but what you see is that this ad. Um, was bombarded really. I mean, it got over over a hundred, well over a hundred thousand views. It got massive downvotes, and like to think that you'd actually be able to get every single one of you know one of this uh, of one of these bigger channel subscribers to to click downvote on that video. It's not very likely. But what you saw is that that it, that I guess our memes really kind of perpetuated themselves uh, beyond just kind of the uh, right wing. Uh, Twitter sphere and the right wing YouTube sphere in that they've really kind of um, seeped into mainstream culture in a real way. I had made the comment earlier that um, uh, when you see these nerd channels talking about things like, uh, uh, you know, back in maybe 2015, they might have said things like, oh, like triggered SJW or something like that. But now they're actually talking about things like the Great Replacement and stuff like that. Or they, they might not make a video about it, but they'll kind of uh, throw a wink and a nod to it. It's, it's meta politics in action, really. And um, kind of going back to what uh, we were saying is that, that the meta politics really is global because it needs to be when the, the attack is global. I mean, I'm not Scandinavian, uh, but, you know, everyone in our sphere kind of rallied around, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess you could say um, bombarding that video and really making them look bad. And it was reported in the mainstream media. So you, you really even saw um the scandinavian ad uh in the mainstream media getting um uh of course they were saying like oh hate mongers are, are attacking this uh this ad but that's what i'd say um is definitely the best the what the dissident right has been the best at and i definitely think that's kind of the way forward because um you can't really just work through a national context anymore because when you um because like we had mentioned that the the attack is global the culture is global the economics are global and the response uh, and what has been a su the successful response i mean in the preliminary based on judging by the number by the numbers we have is global yeah and what i find incredible as well is that at the same time that that's developing it just seems that television and Hollywood are getting more more brazen. It's like sometimes it's like they're not even trying anymore. Like I was watching the the trailer for um, that new Amazon series. Oh, the Nazi Hunter one. On oh, yeah, God. Like, this is just. I mean, this is just a whole new level. It's like they're not even trying to hide it anymore. But uh, yeah, the comments the comments are pretty white pill. It's 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 all our guys. But. It's one of those things you look at that and you think, well, maybe, uh, you know, this is like a kind of a, a space for us online. You know, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, you still have a lot of normies watching this and they're not, they're not 
taken on board any of these critiques but it's gotten so brazen now it's like there's no way to explain any of this outside of our understanding of things like uh this is something mike enoch always seems saying lately he like he'll, he'll put out something like this and he'll, be, he'll say you know how do you explain this you know rhetorically like how does a liberal explain this how do you explain that there's constantly this misery porn like i'm looking at the trailer for this and it's like just the most distasteful just disgusting orgy of violence against evil nazis and it's like you know how do you explain any of the the stuff that's that's coming out of 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 mainstream culture now but and at the same time you know people are drawn to the the people that are allowed a platform the centrist types like sergan or pjw whatever but you know their critiques as well are so are so weak you know it's always you know so much for the tolerant left again it's just kind of reflecting back at them their own their own morality and it's so uh you know you're not really going anywhere with that and this idea as well like you you always hear with uh you know they'll, they'll point to uh what's that guy's name peel the guy that made this hunter thing they'll, like they'll point to something he did and be like oh this this movie is racist and it's like well what what do you really mean like it's not it's not ra- it's not so much racist so much as it's completely anti-white like you know it's racist to white people but there's a complete unwillingness to to just openly say that like this movie this piece of propaganda is anti-white but i think even even that is changing now and there is i do think people are getting a sense of of the the deeper sort of conflict that's at play here that this isn't like this isn't like woke sjw's that have invaded hollywood and they're you know they're they don't even understand their own logic of liberalism and they're 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 the real racists i think people are starting to understand that this is like an open conflict and that they do see white people as 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 the enemy and with that you are seeing a a growing a growing consciousness of ourselves as as europeans and i guess the sas advert is is a good example of that where you know people in the uk or something will look at that now and see that this is the the same thing that's being done here it's the same thing that's being done in the us and that this is a kind of civilization wide problem and thankfully i do think that even even normies now are kind of moving outside this liberal paradigm i think liberalism is is pretty much dead and yeah that i think is definitely uh, something i'd be happy about because um but like, like you had mentioned that back in maybe 2015 2014 there was this whole like kind of anti-sjw oh look at this woke feminist nut job craze but it's kind of really just revealing itself that well it's not just a bunch of crazy college students and it's not and it's not a bunch of people that have just gone insane it's that there's a very real and a very deliberate program to uh, and what, what can i what can i say on youtube now dis, to displace people of european descent and that i think is really just completely uh i think that that's just completely in the open now i mean uh for anyone who doesn't hasn't seen this ad um it's really quite shocking because like in the first two minutes of the ad, I think uh, like th- there was this, there's some woman in a chair with a bag over her head. Uh, they take off the, the bag and then she says, Oh, where am I? What has happened to me? And then this, she's like some, you know, woman with blonde hair, maybe in her fifties. And then this black woman just says, that's some cu- That's some pretty wise words for a Nazi. And I mean, it's just ridiculous. You can just, it, it, it's gone so far beyond the whole. Uh, it, it's gone so, gone so far beyond um, uh, just being kind of subversive to just being really just on the nose. And um, you know what's what's really uh, one of the developments that I, in kind of our sphere and of right wing thought that I think has been the most productive and has definitely, for me at least, explained most of, uh, has explained a lot to me is the the word woke capital because that really is what that really is the uh the beast that we're up against and it's really i feel revealed itself in the last uh year or so um because you know you you could easily write this stuff off a few years ago as you know just being some crazy college students who are you know getting a bit too much um getting a bit out of hand but you know when goldman sachs is literally making uh policies based on intersectionality when I think like six major banks in the U S are working together to uh, shut down ice to like deny uh, their services to, to, I think I, I, I'll need to find this article again. I can't remember exactly what it said. Um, but there were banks that were uh, essentially collaborating to deny uh, bank banking services to companies that worked with ice. 
So I mean, this isn't this isn't some you know brainwashed leftist uh, like you know who feels bad for Mexicans uh, saying uh, to let them into the country. This is global capital working together to force the borders in this case of the United States, but we see the same thing in the Europe in Europe open, and that has been really the beast the, the face of the beast really revealing itself here. Um, before I do have to read a few super chats because I don't want to miss these. Um, one of them said. Uh, a lesbian horse face vote for Bloomberg. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Has Bloomberg. Keith, yeah. Has uh, we, we can get into that. Uh, has Keith ever read into San, uh, San Antana Damara Astura? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Th think our side needs spiritual elements to attract those more sensitive or and artistic in nature. And what does Keith think about? Oh, uh, actually, we'll. Is that we'll, Sanatana yeah. Derma? Is it? Um, D H A R M A. Yeah, that's um. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's like the uh. There's a guy on YouTube that talks about it, actually. I can't remember his name, but it, it's this idea, like an ancient Hindu idea of like the the eternal law. It's it's like it's kind of like an Eastern conception of logos, basically that there's like an eternal, an eternal natural law, an eternal natural way. But yeah, that gets into the whole sort of traditional. Con traditionalist I guess conception of, of reality you know the Tao or the Dharma or Logos that there is there is some underlying principle of existence that has kind of a, a social order uh, built into the, the the rationality of it so yeah I've, I've looked into that I mean um, I'm not sure I'm not sure how explicit it is that you could derive a social order out of that exactly or how you know, depending on the level of, of esoteric or exoteric, you could use it to justify various things. But uh, just by getting at that point, like, yeah, I suppose I think we do ultimately need some kind of um, some alternative conception of reality rather than this sort of debased materialism. I do tend to agree with Bowden that I think people need something, something beyond that. They need to be able to place their own individual struggle in some larger ontological context i don't think i don't think materialism can last in that sense yeah uh one thing that uh devin stack had said to me when i spoke with him last and we'll get on to bloom uh charlemagne asked about bloomberg also we'll get on to that later but what i wanted to uh i wanted to first ask about was that um uh what he, what he had said was that in order for right-wing ideas to uh to have the same effect and to actually become effective you know people often talk about you know things just need to get bad enough they just need to you know, uh, get bad enough, and then people are going to change something, which I, I disagree with. Uh, what Devin Stack had said was that he thinks that right-wing ideas need to take on a religious zeal the same way that left-wing ideas have. Because um, what I feel is that with the leftists, um, they've taken, they're the, the woke SJW or the upper class shit lib or someone like that. They're thinking religiously because, you know, we can point out on the right that, uh, one of the major problems, I mean, I know that this is, another, this is a materialistic one, but you can say that one of the things is housing prices. I mean, that's the case in Canada, in places like Vancouver or in the UK, they have the same thing and it's going on across the Western world. And one of the big problems is immigration, really. And you can just point that out and or the decline in wages. And you see a leftist doesn't like they don't think of it rationally. What, what, what's going on in their mind is is, is a religious uh kind of um, understanding of some things in a religious belief in egalitarianism. And the second that they connect something to racism, because the religion they've been given is a fundamentally anti-white religion and that uh, anything that is in favor of people of European descent is racism and racism is the biggest evil imaginable. And that's why they react the way they do. That's why like, you know, the traditional leftists who would have been uh, against neoliberalism you know, 40 years ago. That's why they don't exist anymore. That's why you have, um, you, you know, you have the LGBT crowd coming out in defense of global corporations. You know, they'll have Goldman Sachs banners at the Pride Parade. And I do agree that you really need the right wing to take on a kind of religious aspect. Uh, now, I, you know, I'm not one to, to uh, be too particular over that. I don't demand that, you know, People must follow this one branch of Christianity or people must follow this one branch of, I don't know, paganism or whatever. I'm not into paganism, but um, 
I do think that the, that the right does need a religious aspect because, you know, you can, I find that a lot of people on the right have, if, if they really take the real hard materialist approach, like the, 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 the IQ numbers, the demographic numbers, the, uh, and of course these things are important, but when they just take this really, really hard materialistic look at it, I find they get the most black pilled really easily. So what would you say? What would you say to that? Would you, what would you say like religious aspects, the right wing kind of needs to take on? Um, well, I kind of, I kind of have this esoteric theory when I when I look at when I look at the history of ideas and philosophy and religion that I think I have this kind of Gnostic view of history where there's basically two conceptions of reality, which is a materialist and an organic or organicist conception, and that you can you can broadly put ideas into into one of those two categories, and you can you can see certain peoples that kind of a, advance those ideas through time, and you can see those ideas playing out in different battles, whether that was Anglo empiricism versus uh, German idealism, or even in 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 the you know in ancient Greek philosophy, you see it contrasted with maybe like schools of Neoplatonism falling really well into a, an organic theory. But I think I think that that's that materialism now, and with materialism comes you know individualism and comes a, a certain nihilism. Uh, that that's contrasted with an organic vision of reality and i think that that's what the the concept of the dharma or the Tao or logos gets at as well that uh that reality is is not is not uh you know that that the higher isn't generated from the lower but that uh reality is a, an organic process in some way and that uh that the best way to conceive of of individuals and of of human societies is as part of an organism and and then from that you, der you derive a, a morality of of harmony, and an organic organic uh, organic philosophical theories tend to focus on on harmony, uh, especially you know you look at something like uh, like Taoism and uh, you know the idea of, of oneness in Eastern religions, and the, the the corollary of that materialism is is individualism and hedonism and the the conception that the 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 higher is generated from from the lower and the the sort of dissolution of, of hierarchy based on that. So I don't uh, I don't argue that we should go back to any particular uh, religion, but I think that we need uh, an understanding of reality that's not materialistic anymore. Because I think I think it's very difficult to um, to prop up uh, many of the ideas we have about uh, morality or natural order. Or goodness, without some sort of without some sort of organic theory, and without a, a conception of things like uh, the true, the good, the beautiful, as 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 something transcendent, uh, rather than the the materialist explanation that uh, these are all sort of derivative of of chemical processes, and that consciousness is an illusion, and that none of these hierarchies make sense except as social constructions. I think I, I'd firmly place the the problem with materialism itself. Yeah, I think that um, I, my, I myself am a Christian. I'm Baptist, Protestant, uh, but I don't really see. Um, and you know, it, I, I feel like whatever religion you are part of, it, it, it can be a very, it can be a cure to modernity, or at least it can help it. But I don't know if there is really is gonna, it's really gonna be possible to have one particular religion, at least not one that's existed in the past, as kind of the unifying force for the right wing or for you know whatever it is. You want to call it the dissident right. I feel though that um, the the two things that that I feel could be kind of a unifying force is one of them is pan European is kind of the pan European uh, angle that you know um, uh, your what's under attack is essentially European civilization, our our um, collective uh, our, our, you know our collective civilization, which of course you know never was. I never argue that it was like this unified thing, but. It certainly existed in a. Um, it, it certainly existed in a sense that it, you're, you know Europe is very different than say, and it's been its extension that being you know places like America, Canada, and such. It is fundamentally different from say, you know, the Middle East or Asia, and that that is what's uh, un fundamentally under attack by global by global capital, and that really is kind of the uh, something that I think. All, everyone basically involved can get uh, get behind the, the defense of and get behind the appreciation of because you know you can point out the um, the uh, Scandinavian ad so you'll, you'll that, that basically made everyone 
uh, kind of on the right wing, at least on the real right wing, not on the uh, the cuck right wing. But it made everyone mad, um, and it's something that everyone would would you know rally to uh, rally in defense against. You know, so it's something that you can get the uh, you can get the traditional Catholics, you can get the ethno nationalists, you can get the um, maybe even the pagans, even though they're kind of cringy. But you know what? Fine, <laughs> uh, not to get into that. Um, but uh, so kind of having that that kind of the pan European idea, and that's why I think that the petty nationalism that we had mentioned earlier really is uh, not very helpful because um, it prevents that from happening. Really, like I've gotten messages from people many of them from maybe continental Europe saying, Oh, I'm not, uh, I'm not like you. I'm not, uh, I'm not white. I'm not, I'm, Oh, I don't know, uh, Danish or something like that. How dare you say this? And I thought, well, okay, you're, you're using my language. You're watching my video, you're consuming my media and your country is under attack in the exact same sense that mine is. And they, they don't care that they don't care about, you know, our, um, our so-called, um, they, they don't care about our traditional nation states. They care about you, because you're European. And then I think, the sec secondly, the other aspect I thought of is that kind of a longing for order, because um, I think that neoliberalism, it creates disorder, it creates uh, chaos in people's lives. They don't have uh, really a sense of, uh, of order that really makes people feel comfortable. And I think that, you know, kind of an appreciation for longevity and an appreciation for order and civilization, as, as they would have once called it, I think that is another um, kind of underlying, uh, another underlying kind of religious aspect that I feel people on the dissident right definitely could get behind. So, um, what would you think about either of those? Uh, yeah, well, on your last point, um, I definitely agree with that in the sense that I do think that uh, you know, for all the talk we might do about ideal societies, or whatever, and people sort of demanding demanding solutions. I do think there's an extent to which if we just lost our hostile elite uh, tomorrow, that it wouldn't actually take very long for Europeans to revert to a natural moral way of life. Um, and even for individual European states, I think if the influence of, of the United States, the, the Zionist cultural influence didn't exist, it wouldn't take long for Europe to return to a, a, a more organic, uh, natural sort of European politics. Uh, so, you know, to a certain extent, we kind of only need to uh, remove the, the poisonous elements of this system. And I do feel that in, in a certain sense, we'll, we'll revert to a, a natural a natural way of living and a, some sort of natural spirituality. The other thing about talking about religions is, look, I don't think it's possible that any of us are going to uh, to like you can't you know you can't choose a religion with politics i don't think we're going to choose a, a belief system and that you know then if we win we're going to like that's going to be like the religion of europe or whatever like that's that's not how it, how it works and i don't think there's any way to forecast where what direction spirituality will go in what will pop up um if some kind of protestantism will will become the dominant christianity any of that so you know to to a large extent uh I wouldn't, even if I if I believed in a particular doctrine, I wouldn't be advocating that like this should be the the doctrine of Europe or something. Yeah, I'm not but, advocating um, that either. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. Uh, but as far as the the concept of of European identity being something to unite around, I agree with that. And you know, something you see a lot. I know this was very popular a couple of years ago. That there was all these race realism debates. And there'd be like uh, there'd be like four or five hour debates between like uh, internet Naked people and Crichton, Crichton T. Yeah. Oh, good uh, times about human biodiversity and all this. But I don't. I, I never got too into those arguments because, from my perspective, it's like, okay, I'm going to watch this argument. But like, if the if the race denier guys, you know, quote, quote unquote, win the argument, is that going to change anything about my beliefs? It's not. So like that tells me that whatever they're arguing about actually isn't the, the key factor in this. And I think the problem is that these people are all, again, arguing from this materialist lens where if something can't be quantified, uh, if something can't be pinned down materially, that uh, it doesn't exist. Alfred North Whitehead, the, the philosopher, called it the, I think he called it the fallacy of simple location, that if something doesn't have a simple location in, in space-time, that it doesn't exist. And... Uh, 
this this sort of fallacious thinking is used to to write off all all manner of of uh, legitimate branches of knowledge, and from the perspective of race, when people say, "Well, there's not you can't exactly pinpoint uh, what the white race is," and what about this person on the edge that's like quarter Turkish or something like all this kind of stuff is it, it misses the point. Um, and the point is that the fact that something like the distant right has sprung up and the fact that it seems that people do have an instinctive understanding of what white or what European civilization is means that there is some kind of unifying point that we can rally around, which is that we can conceive ourselves as the defender of uh, an Occidental tradition. And that's not something that needs uh, that needs four hours of argumentation around genetics to prove that it's a legitimate category. And I find that this is really a sort of sinister form of, of, of postmodern relativism where anything that can't be uh, sort of succinctly pinned down into a predictive formula doesn't exist. It actually it actually kind of reminds me of um, uh, Francis Parker Yockey, like, I wouldn't agree with Yaki's idea of race completely. He had this like subjective idea of race that people like Spengler had. But there is a, a good quote from, from Yaki I have pulled up here. Uh, he says, race is, in the first instance, in its subjective sense, what a man feels. This influences whether immediately or eventually what he does. A man of race is not born to slavery. If his intellect counsel him to a temporary submission rather than a heroic death in the hope of future changes, it is a mere postponement of his breaking out. The man without race will submit permanently to any humiliation, any insult, any dishonor, so long as he is permitted to live. The continuance of breathing and digestion are life to the man without race. To the man of race, life itself represents no value, but only life under the right conditions, affirmative life, rich, expressive, and growing. So Yaki has this really interesting idea that uh, basically race race isn't real for the the person that denies it but it is real for the the person that affirms it and this this conception that there are there are people that race there are people that these categories mean nothing to and these are just the like the, the sort of you know the dustbin of history these are the people that are always there that don't change history but that the people that affirm uh, this identity and that affirm a, a positive identity around something like race they're the people that sort of transcend the the biological immediacy of of life and and leave a greater legacy so i think that's that's quite a, a good passage by yaki and yeah i guess i'm just pushing back against like i don't i don't ever engage in these like endless arguments about race realism or stuff because i don't i don't think it's necessary important because i think everyone in this understands what it is we're fighting for understands what it is to be european and understands in some sense that there is some kind of Europeanness that that we all inherit. Yeah, I mean, if somebody like pulled out a, a faction, like for example, I, I I instinctually know that a place like say um, uh, Paris or Saint Petersburg or um, maybe even you know somewhere in Canada like uh, Charlottetown, like it appeals to me on a more instinctual level in a way that you know a place like I don't know um, uh, Riyadh and Saudi Arabia just couldn't. I just couldn't like identify with it in the same sense. Uh, but if someone you know pulled out a, a fact sheet and said to me, "Well, actually, this is what you're thinking is actually not true scientifically," I I have a hard time actually thinking that I'd be able to change my opinion that that quickly. So there is the aspect that um, well, there's a lot of people have actually brought that up before, and I I do think that you know it's important to. Uh, I don't completely abandon the the realm of say race realism because it is important to actually kind of formulate the uh, the factual basis of it. But at the same time, it's not entirely the uh, it's not entirely what's going to change someone's mind. Like I don't find that many people. No one changes their mind by being shown a uh, a spreadsheet. No one looks at a spreadsheet and thinks, well, maybe maybe uh, you know I was pro mass immigration. Now I'm anti mass immigration. It usually doesn't work like that. So, I mean, I, I do agree uh, in that sense. One thing you had said earlier that um, I actually don't know, I actually would probably say I'd have to disagree with is that if the uh, hostile elite in America and Europe was removed tomorrow, that they'd soon descend into a more natural state. I don't know if I entirely agree with that because um, what you see in countries like, uh, say, Japan, Saudi Arabia, um, what other examples do we have? Uh, Turkey. 
um, whilst they don't have such a hostile elite, there isn't like people in charge actively trying to destroy their civilization. They still kind of suffer from a lot of the problems of, uh, of modernity in that uh, a lot of their traditions are dying just because of things like consumerism. So I don't know, I mean, maybe if you'd like to clarify a bit, but I, I don't know if I would, I would agree with the point that what all that needs to happen is kind of just the removal of the hostile elite to kind of refer to a more traditional society. Yeah, maybe that was badly phrased. I mean, you know, if the if the hostile elite disappeared, we we would still be left with this kind of zombified economic system and whatnot that would kind of reproduce itself. I, I guess. Um, I mean, it would know, make a world. Of, it would make a world of difference. I'm not denying that, but I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, no, but we would we would be in a, a similar position to to Japan, where they're kind of in this like a historical state now, where they're like. Yeah, they're not a, they're not in a good place culturally, but I I mean more um, you know, for all the talk about like uh, you know, we need solutions that we need to sort of construct exactly what uh, uh, it's going to look like if if our side win. I mean, if we were to if if it was to sort of start from scratch, if all of these systems were to disappear tomorrow, and European people were just to start over, uh there's no way just because of the, the i guess the the bio spirit of, of european people there's no way it it lead to to uh to anything other than something sort of sort of natural and moral uh and suited to the european people so i, I guess that's what i mean by that is is there is always going to be you know the idea of dharma or logos that there is always going to be within people uh, a natural uh tendency towards towards the good for themselves so that's 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 what i mean by that yeah, I, I guess I would agree that um, in the sense that kind of neoliberalism and social liberalism by extension can only really exist in a hyper um, consumeristic, very wealthy society. And that, uh, you know, in say, <laughs> in say, in say uh, I don't know, the Wild West of the, you know, in America in the 1880s or something, things like uh you know feminism or lgbt or something like that that just could, there's just no way that could exist because uh it just doesn't have the economic uh prosperity to allow kind of such uh um for lack of a better term uh degeneracy to really exist uh so i would agree that you know if you not that this is going to happen because you know i don't think you, you're going to actually really have that anytime soon that the economic system is removed Yes, I do think people would revert to a more traditional way of life because I think that is the natural order. However, yeah, under I, I'm not entirely convinced that under a modern economic system, but without a hostile elite necessarily, without some kind of religious change, I don't know if it would revert to a tr more traditional society right away. Um, I got a, another comment. I got a comment from Charlemagne, uh, and we're, we'll get on to Bloomberg in a minute. Uh, the mechanisms of paganism of pagan thinking are important to integrate into the right because they're not universalist and they see beyond modern thinking. I mean, uh, I'd say I agree. I, I'm, I have nothing against elements of pagan thinking. Sure. Uh, I think that there, that it's an interesting topic. I guess my, uh, I don't want to counter signal the entire idea, but my problem is kind of the, the LARPers on the internet when it comes to paganism, but yeah, you know, I, I'm always open to kind of in integrating, uh, certain like aspects of Western thought into uh, into my worldview, and I got another super chat. Only Apollism will save us. Read Mark Brahman. I don't know who that is. Have you read Mark Brahman? Uh, he's got he's got a blog. Uh, he he does a lot of shows with with Richard Spencer on the NPI Radix channel. Um, he's got a blog about uh, what he calls esoteric moralization in in. Uh, media in Hollywood and uh, gets into a lot of interesting themes about, you know, these kinds of ideas about how uh, sort of esoteric ideas are passed down through uh, disseminated through culture. And uh, as far as I know, I don't know a lot about the Apollonianism, but it's it's his sort of proposal for like a, a new European spirituality centered around the figure of Apollo. Okay, uh, I, I'll, ha I'll have to look into it. I unfortunately don't know too much about him. Uh, so the other thing uh, that I think is, is worth discussing is the, the, I guess, the Bloomberg question, because uh, you had released a video uh, this week to, uh, where you had come out in favor of Bloomberg. And uh, I actually had a discussion on my Discord server the other night with uh, Distributist, Charlemagne, and a few other guys uh, about um, 
about Bloomberg and, you know, who would be the best presidential candidate in America. And uh, there was a, quite a bit of disagreement uh, uh, amongst us. Um, so I guess what would you say your what, what is your reason that you kind of think Michael Bloomberg would be the best outcome uh, for the 2020 presidential campaign? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did have fun with this. I got, I got a lot of flack for this one, man. A lot of people thought I was joking, but I am I am genuinely serious that I think a, a Bloomberg win would be the best possible scenario for the dissident right. Because first of all, I look at it and I see firstly that people that in 2015, and I remember I remember seeing them, people that in 2015 were basically calling for a, a fascist regime, mass deportations, building a giant wall on the border, all this kind of stuff, are now posting uh, stuff about socialism was a failure in venezuela and like all these like awful like paul ryan sean hannity talking points against bernie sanders and it just shows that the the only serious effect of trump in office has been that he served as a, a pressure release valve for the uh the momentum that ethno-nationalism and that movements like the alt-right the alt-light had in 2015 and he's he sublimated that into this weak brand of conservatism that's all about low taxes, uh, low black unemployment rates, and Zionism. And I think that I don't think there's any question that we'd actually be better off if if Trump had lost, because that momentum uh, wouldn't have been sublimated. And if there was something like the massive crackdown, the censorship that we've seen in the last few years and it was Hillary in office, there would have been a, a huge backlash. Uh, in large part, you know, to a large extent, right-wingers tend to go to sleep when, when, they, when they have electoral success. And I think yeah, it, there's a clear link between Trump winning and the, the complete loss of momentum or the death of the, the dissident space that was, that was occupied by the right in 2016. And looking at 2020, you know, if Trump wins, the question isn't really where we're going to be in 2020, it's where we're going to be in, in 2024. And looking at it, you know, Trump has signed uh, this bill to allow all these like uh, skilled uh, workers into the United States. And it's 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 going to displace the, the white middle class in the US. The demographic changes are going to continue. Nothing fundamentally is going to change. Um, and again he'll serve as this pressure release valve for for populist thinking and the right will be in a much worse position in 2024 but if someone like bloomberg wins bloomberg is an avatar of everything we hate he's an avatar of zionist neoliberalism and because of that there's no way to oppose bloomberg except as a billionaire oligarch uh, promoting neoliberalism and so, you know, unlike if Bernie wins, we're going to get four years of, of uh, Red Scare, Cold War stuff about him uh, being a Bolshevik or whatnot. And there could also be, um, you know, a, another factor is the left, is that the left are going to feel like they've had a victory and he's going to get stymied. He's not going to be able to push through many of the economic reforms he wants to a large extent, very similar to Obama. They'll stop him spending money on a lot of things. And the left will blame the, you know, the the patriarchal white Republican Party, and basically we're just going to go further into this false dialectic of um, neoliberal conservatism versus open border socialism. So I don't think any of those scenarios are good. But if Bloomberg wins, the only way he can win is by screwing over Bernie using demographics. He's ignoring white voters. He's completely focusing on appealing to. Uh, non-whites and basically buying their support he spent half a billion dollars so if he wins he's going to destroy a populist movement of uh, of the left and then he's going to destroy what remains of the populist movement of trumpism and there's going to be a massive disaffected base of of trump and bernie supporters of of nationalists and and socialists and uh, we're going to have a leader of the united states that perfectly represents what the united states is and there's no way you can't oppose Bloomberg and say that he's a secret communist. You can't, you know, the left can't oppose him as a, an evil white man for obvious reasons. And there's no way to oppose him. except they, they, that, They'll still call him a white man. Yeah, well, I will have to disagree on that one. Yeah, as I was saying, I kind of laughed thinking, yeah, he probably will just be a white guy for four years. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think it would actually wake a lot of people up. And I just much prefer to have, let's like, nothing's going to change. Trump is just going to govern it the exact same way as Bloomberg anyway. Maybe Bloomberg is going to do more to try and take guns. 
but let's just have let's just be open about it for four years and let's show people that america is an oligarchical technocracy and then let's form opposition to it around that rather than just just four more years of just charlie kurt talking points just nothingness under trump yeah um i actually don't think i really agree because i think for first of all in 2016 i'd argue that trump's win uh whilst not be very successful uh policy wise meta politically was actually a very good thing for the right wing um uh greg johnson had actually uh asked that same question and he said that he thought trump's victory was actually a very good thing for the right wing because it really was a real shot across it was a real shot at the at the narrative and a, a real shot at the establishment because what it really showed was that people aren't really on board with globalization like the media and the intelligentsia would have you believe because um what you had what you really had was that uh the narrative they were going with was that you know trump trumpism and back in 2016 and that was it was the last gasp of you know racism as they called it or white supremacy whatever you want to you know the whatever talking points they used back then um and that uh that was just going to be defeated and everyone was you know just on board with the new progressive america and that really wasn't shown to be the case and it you know the left looked a lot worse coming out of that loss because it looked uh, the left had nowhere to go they had doubled down on this uh on this idea that everyone was on board with uh or at least the vast majority are, are on board with the um the progress and that it was just a couple of white racists who didn't who were unhappy with it and that re and it really did send them into a um into a much more a, a much more of a panic mode and to me at least that was one of the, th the it was the less reaction to trump that was one of the more red pilling things for me it was really kind of just seeing the real viciousness that uh trump had the ability to bring out in the left and i'd say that definitely meta politically it was a victory for uh the right wing the other thing i'll say is that um in in terms of uh in, in, in hmm. I mean, in terms of Bloomberg, I I think that one of the problems with him is that he's essentially neoliberalism embodied, as you had mentioned. But the thing is, is that the crackdown would be, a, uh, you know, if neo neoliberalism wants censorship, it, it wants right wingers off the Internet. I'd be I don't think Bloomberg would be against doing that. What uh, the argument that uh, the distributors put forward to me is that he has the business connections in his pocket. He can easily just phone up these social media companies and say, uh, you know, shut, uh, shut it the fuck down. Um, uh, whereas Trump, he's not, he's certainly not delivering policy wise, at least not to any extent that any of us would want him to, but he's not actively hunting down right wingers. Whereas, I mean, I, I, Bernie Sanders would probably be like having Antifa in the white house. Whereas Bloomberg, um, I, I don't, I, I could easily see him, uh, cracking down on us, maybe not to the same extent as Bernie would, but, uh, in the in a very real sense in that i think um trump does buy the dissident right more time because i don't i don't necessarily agree that the dissident right hasn't made progress in the trump era because whilst there is still the maga boomer there is still the cringy you know anti-socialism charlie kirk kind of brand a lot of that has actually a lot of people have peeled away from that uh, but the thing is that you're always going to have the kind of the NPC who just kind of loves Trump because he's Trump and he likes to wear the hat and say, make America great again. But in terms of the more uh, politically active people, I do find a lot of them are moving towards a, a more a, are moving further right. And I, I think la lastly, what I'd say is that, you know, the dis a, a Trump victory would buy the dissident right more time to organize before kind of the. The storm that's going to come which is eventually going to come regardless you know 2024 there's not going to be any more republican presidents i mean once texas goes that's the entire country and i do feel like there's going to be a much bigger crackdown i think the crackdown we've seen while trump hasn't done much to combat it it was all after the election that it was a reaction to trump more than it was a preempt preemptively trying to shut down populism it was more them realizing, oh shit, there's, this thing actually has legs. Let's shut it down while we can. What would you say to that? Yeah, but I mean, look at where look at where we are in the internet now compared to 2016. I mean, Trump hasn't done anything. Like, 
I th- I don't think the I don't think the censorship would have been even that much that much worse under Hillary Clinton. I think it's gone exactly the way the way they expected it to go. In fact, they probably I think to a large extent they went after the right more due to Trump winning because they didn't want to allow such a thing to happen again. So, look, I'm sure Bloomberg would do censorship, and I'm sure Bernie will do censorship, and I'm sure the exact same amount will happen under Trump because. There's just um, I don't see any reason to have faith in Trump or to assume that he's he's doing anything to try and protect internet censorship or anything like this because he's had he's had four years and he hasn't even made an attempt to do anything about it. So you know, and the only difference is you know the idea as well of where I'd push back against that he'll buy us another four years to generate more momentum. Well, like where's the momentum now? Look at 2019 compared to 2017. The tendency is towards more infighting, uh, more splintering, um, more separation off into these kind of silos where uh, individual groups talk to each other, constant attacks between these different groups. And I think to a large extent that can be um, related to Trump being in power as well, because there was virtually no infighting in, in 2016. You know, the alt-light and the alt-right were all coming together, and it's because there was this unifying force of 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 trump and there was this unifying evil of of hillary clinton but with trump in power there's no clear um uh center of opposition you know part of the right support trump part of the right direct their attention elsewhere at certain people and there's just no clear direction at least if bloomberg is in office there's a very clear enemy and there's clearly something to push back against without the infighting of you know, trust the plan of uh, this is part of some greater plan or, you know, Trump's hands are tied here. Yeah, 4D chess. I mean, if 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 someone like Bloomberg had been in power for the last four years, I don't think that people would have would have sat around and taken taken some of the things that have that's happened. So I just I mean, I, I, I appreciate your arguments, but I just don't see I think the tendency the whole time Trump has been in power is just year by year this and right gets weaker it gets more persecuted i mean you know we're at the stage now i mean they they basically have completely censored us already i mean like there's you know we can't we can't say anything on this stream really uh and you know all of those big channels you named they were just shut down for political reasons some of the things the fbi are, are doing in the u.s to specifically target white nationalists is is very disturbing and they're they have them on a, a pair with ISIS now. And you know, you know, you look at someone like James Fields, who got seven life sentences after Charlottesville, and I just don't see anything that Trump has achieved. He, he's the worst combination. He's kind of explicitly pro-white, and he gets people to rally around that, but he's implicitly anti-white. And then all the supporters take the flack and take the pushback of the left being especially anti-white because he's in power. But they get none of the benefits. They still still get the demographic and economic changes that would have come under a Jeb Bush presidency. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely would agree that Trump has not been uh, very uh, has not been positive in our direction. I guess just my concern would be uh, to what extent would the weight of the state come down against uh, right wingers if uh, with a Democrat in office? I mean, I guess from my perspective. Uh, being in Canada, I don't really see how, like, you know, Trudeau being in power for the last five years has really galvanized the right wing to the same extent that uh, um, it has been in other European countries. I mean, I, I'd say that's like countries like America and certainly Britain, I think, is a lot further ahead. And they've been under, um, you know, obviously a globalist uh, party, but not a explicitly, you know, and not an explicitly anti-white party, just an implicitly one, uh, one which I kind of has their hand is a bit tied that they can't take the full force of the state against the right wing, but at the same same time, they won't push back against it. I guess, um, hmm. I, yeah, well, I, I guess what just what, just what worries me is because a lot of the censorship it's from third parties. It is from the coming from the tech companies. It's coming from the media, the kind of the smears. And then there's the, the groups like the ADL, which are organizing a lot of it. What what does scare me though is the 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 um certainly with Bernie is the the idea of a uh, the the government so the, like the White House essentially using a strong arm against nationalists in the in a way that only the private sector is right now. I mean, they they a lot of people made the same argument in the UK about um what would happen if uh, 
the Labour Party had won. And a lot of them are saying that a lot of right wingers would end up in prison. So, I mean, that's where I am. That's where my concern kind of comes from. I will agree that uh, of the Democratic candidates, Bloomberg is probably the best because uh, of the, the argument, the argument that he is essentially the embodiment of neoliberalism. I guess just my concern comes from whether or not uh, Trump uh, has his hands kind of tied that he he can't he won't use the weight of the state against right wingers, whereas I feel like a Democrat would. I, that that would be the major that would be the major deciding factor for me. I don't know. I just when I look at some of the things the FBI has done the past few years, and even I think today or yesterday there was a, a decision made about Charlottesville that basically totally wrote off the right of of the the protesters to any kind of free speech and threw out the case. I just don't see I just don't see any great difference uh, under Trump. But you know, one of the it's not for me. It's not even just about. Um, Trump versus Bloomberg or the comparative advantages of a Trump presidency, the big thing is is screwing over the, the Bernie bros because if Bloomberg wins, he's going to have done it by uh, using wealth to buy off uh, non-white voters. And this will just expose the sham of, of multicultural democracy. Um, and, you know, even if they don't want to admit it, the the Bernie movement is a is a white movement, and Bloomberg has ignored white states uh, for the primaries, and he's he's completely focused on targeting southern, more multiracial states with with heavy advertising, and this this will expose something which is that multicultural cities like uh, New York is a good example which he governed that the tendency actually isn't towards socialism, but the tendency in these. Uh, multicultural cities with African style wealth inequality is towards uh, oligarchical rule and towards greater neoliberalism. And that presents a serious issue for the left. So Bloomberg winning would completely blackpill the Bernie bros and it would expose the uh, the sham of American democracy because he would have destroyed the, the populist movement of Bernie with demographics and then at the same time conservative voters would be looking at and they'd be looking at the electoral map and they'd say the only reason we don't have a, a republican president now is is purely because of demographics and non-whites and that presents that presents an interest in space for more nationalist or uh, dissident type people to to enter into the discussion for the next four years yeah i think one thing that would i guess support that argument would be the um there's one concept that uh Moldbug often talks about is the two uh, the two narrative system in that you have essentially two narratives one being that of the Democrats one that being that of the Republicans kind of uh, presenting a false a false dichotomy when they are both essentially pushing in the same direction of neoliberalism and what Moldbug had argued was that the destruction of the Republican Party would kind of force those two narratives to merge and I guess uh, I would I would take the point that it, it, in a Bloomberg presidency. It would cause the the he is essentially the worst of both worlds. He is the awful uh, leftist social policy. Even though I know he he doesn't believe in any of that, of course not. He she believes in it because that's what's politically viable. Um, and the neoliberal economic policy. He's kind of the the uh, the marriage of those two. And in that sense, he would actually, in many ways, do what Moldbug said the right would need to do is to merge those two narratives in order for another narrative to form because um what he what he had said was that um a one narrative state is much more openly totalitarian and much more openly uh um it's much it, it, it does expose the sham of democracy and that would be the the in kind of the merging of the two uh fake narratives until the one true narrative would be the conditions under which that would be able to that would be, be able to happen so I guess, I guess in, in that, that would be an argument in favor of Bloomberg. I guess my big concern is how, how, heavy, will the, how heavy will the hammer come down and uh, whether or not um, the dissident right would be, or, would be organized enough in the, it, by 2020 to actually be able to resist that. So um, the, the, other, the other argument a lot of people have made is uh, about his kind of quote unquote based comment about stop and frisk. Um, I guess what I'll say to that is uh, I, he's definitely not going to follow up on that. One thing I don't, I, the other thing, um, one thing I do, I don't like is people on the right supporting a democratic candidate because they had, they, what they made 
one, you know, politically incorrect tweet or one politically incorrect comment, like Andrew Yang tweeting about white suicides. And, you know, he's not our guy because of that one tweet. But with Bloomberg, I mean, he's going to give into that because uh, it's not politically viable for him. He, Like you mentioned, he wants the minority votes. And secondly, he's going to do what global capital wants him to do. And that would be not, it, it would be, you know, progressive politics. It would be not enforcing stop and frisk. So I don't know. Do you think on, on the whole, uh, his kind of, uh, uh, his um, kind of more based comment on uh, the stop and frisk, do you think he'd actually follow up on any of that? No, uh, no, I didn't get, I didn't give any, any weight at all to that. I did think it was funny afterwards. Some people were like, Oh, Keith Woods is supporting Bloomberg because he thinks he's our guy because he's so based on race. It's like, no, no, no. It's the opposite. <laughs> it's like the complete opposite of, of my reason. But no, the the thing about Bloomberg, you see, people look at that and they think like, oh, he's secretly based. But it's like, no. All of all of the, the people like Bloomberg are like this. It's not that it's not that he's he's secretly based, it's that he's completely cynical and that he's he's okay with using this policy to protect his people, to protect his demographic living in, in Manhattan, New York. Um, but then he'll ha- he'll happily knowing knowing the differences between these people he'll he'll happily still flood the country with them because it's it's fundamentally yeah, yeah. affecting a demographic he doesn't care about. He's not going to be doing it in South Carolina. Let's just say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I I think I guess another thing that that would be good would be that uh, and I, I mean I, there's pr- plenty of ways to expose this, but the uh, when you see Bloomberg's excuse on why he. Uh, on, on uh, why he had said those comments back in 2015. I really enjoyed uh, American Renaissance video on, on on Bloomberg's comments this past week that uh, his excuse was that, oh, he now understands that he was being racist. He now understands it, you know, when he's 78 year old, years old. <laughs> I mean, it just goes to show that all these politicians know, they, they know the, 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 uh, the, the reality of race. They're denying it for, for uh, to advance a different agenda, it's not really something that they're just dumb about. I mean, maybe there's a few of them that are legitimately dumb, but the ones that are actually, uh, you know, I, I always say, you know, the, the middle class shit libs, they're the ones that are like legitimately dumb. They're the ones that actually have bought into the religion. When it comes to the politicians and the oligarchs, they they know the they know the reality. They just it's it's what's they're pushing to advance the agenda. I got another question from Charlemagne. One more thing. What do you think of my analogy? Neoliberalism is to fascism as international communism is to the Soviet Union. Hmm. I'd have to think about that for a while. Um, Whoa. <laughs> well, I guess the so the implication is that neoliberalism is like an internationalized version of fascism. Uh, well, I would disagree with that. Probably. I, w- I definitely disagree with that. It's a fundamentally different ontology. Neoliberalism is uh, a logical, I don't know what I say, extension, but it, it's it's very closely related to classical liberalism. The, it, it, the fundamental distinction is that of all liberalism, uh, the fundamental starting point is that it takes the individual as the ontological starting point. It takes it as the, the ontological center. And that's completely at odds with fascism. Fascism takes the uh, state as the starting point and only conceives of the individual as an individual that's always living in a state or in some social context. So I don't think the two are comparable. It's more like neoliberalism is to liberalism what international communism is to the Soviet Union. Because as I said earlier, what, what marked the beginning of neoliberalism was the the disappearance of of embedded liberalism with things like the Bretton Woods Agreement, and uh, no longer being being reliant on 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 individual nation states political economy, so I think that that'd be a better that'd be a better analogy. Yeah, I I don't I'm sorry I'm sorry I don't ex- exactly know what if I'm if that's what Charlemagne was actually asking. I'll have to uh, you can message me uh, afterwards and uh, about that. Um, yeah, I would say that well, neoliberalism does have authoritarian elements. I mean, it's it's true in that sense. It does present itself as an extension of classical liberalism, uh, but that's not entirely accurate. It, it is the difference between classical liberalism and neoliberalism is neoliberalism doesn't actually really weaken the force of the state. It just kind of reorients the state to uh, redirect its power to the the elite class. So, I would that say sense, that. 
I, I'd say, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, oh, go ahead, that. guys. I'm pretty much finished that point. Oh, no. What I would say is that uh, neoliberalism is really like the, 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 re, the, re, the real world manifestation of classic liberalism in the same sense that the Soviet Union would have been the real, uh, the, the real manifestation of uh, international communism. That, you know, they, they can, uh, like, neo, like liberalism can uh, ideologically be about all about freedom and equality right. and, uh, you know, happiness, pursuit of happiness, property, and all that stuff. But then it really just ends up being, you know, the global homo uh corporation corporations and these like cosmopolitan cities that's really what it ends up being in the same yeah way that's, that. that's a very good that's a very good point actually because uh because I, I was thinking about that today because someone was arguing with me uh about i can't remember exactly what it was about but basically he was like uh whatever i pointed to he was like no that's not capitalism uh this is capitalism and what he pointed to was basically like uh what capitalism looked like in like one decade in the 19th century and it's like well what you're just arbitrarily picking that point like they always do this they're like well no all this stuff after like the you know after the 1920s or something is, is socialism but this point here is like is the is what capitalism really gives you and it's like well you're you're kind of just arbitrarily picking that point like how capitalism is like fundamentally uh, fluid and innovative so how are you just going to freeze it at like at one point in time like sort of by necessity it needs it needs growth and it needs commodification so by its nature you can't just sort of freeze it in, in time and have like cyclical history from that point onwards so when you see people saying like oh well this is all uh i don't believe in any of this stuff i'm a classical liberal as as in like if you know if things just stayed the word the way they were in the 80s none of this would have happened but it's like the logic of your classical liberalism allowed this to, to be created so why wouldn't it be created again there's obviously a, a flow in 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 the logic of your own beliefs there that's that's allowed this yeah well one of the analogy that i use is saying that uh that the modern west is not real liberalism is the same as the you know the college student who says that that the soviet union and stalin wasn't real communism well fine you can say that uh you know ideologically it shouldn't have turned out like that well it did though and that's the real world manifestation of it and yeah and, all yeah. they're really all they're, all they're really saying when they say that 99 percent of the time is i don't like this but i don't want to abandon being a liberal you know it's yeah. they're not actually saying this isn't a, a a natural extension of liberalism they're just like can't i have liberalism without this and it's like well not really yeah what i say about, about sargon is that he's he's he loves the idea of liberalism but he he absolutely hates the uh the results of liberalism really yeah but again and again it's this liberal. idea again it's this idea that we can just sort of we can we can look at a, spe a specific time period or a specific point of liberalism and we can just kind of freeze it there but again in the very in the very nature of of liberalism and individualism there is a, a fluidity and an innovation there that means that freezing it at a particular point in time isn't really possible and that it's always going to be this kind of open system that will lead to the forms of innovation and forms of commodification that you may not necessarily be comfortable with but then that's a problem of the internal logic of that system rather than it being somehow subverted yeah and what i'd say is kind of the solution is you need something that is a lot more uh that has more longevity in that you know uh you can't just point at say the 1950s if you're the if you're the the boomer conservative or the um 1990s if you're the you know classic liberal sargonite you have to have something that will with actual longevity because the reality is that um the decisions made post World War II are manifesting themselves now. And you can't really, uh, once that's set in motion and not only that, but you also can, the other thing is I will point out that the subversion was definitely set in motion back then. So it was kind of design, uh, kind of the way that the work that the 1990s were, it was really designed to bring about what we have now. You know, I always say that the, you know, um, and I know that this argument's kind of dying because it's just been proven wrong, but a lot of them say, I'm colorblind, I don't see race, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Well, I mean, that's kind of an idea that was put into your mind specifically to disarm you for what's happening now and to uh, uh, get you to accept uh, to accept that process. And it's been abandoned now that it, the, the realities of it are being exposed as false. So, yeah, and I think that in terms of, in terms of that, uh, you need something that actually has longevity because um, 
when you when you look at the system of liberalism, you, we're seeing its fruits right now, and you can't really oppose. Uh, you can't oppose, you know, the 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 triggered SJW, whatever, and not actually attack the roots of the system that bring that brings that about. That being neoliberalism, that being uh, the uh, economic and the social system that exists today. Yeah, and if you say if someone says it was subverted, you have to ask the question: Why was it possible to subvert it? And you're specifically looking at liberalism, just from a game theory perspective. If you have, uh, you know, if you have this open game where everyone is is playing uh, with an individualist logic and the set of rules are geared towards individualism, but then you have a, a group of players that are uh, that have a, a high in group preference and aren't playing by aren't out for themselves and are, are working together. Inevitably, those people are going to uh, are going to rise to the top and are going to win the game. So, there's clearly a, a, a failure of the internal logic there, specifically of of uh, of not having a, a totally homogenous society and and having liberalism combined, which obviously needs to be addressed by a liberal. But even even with ethnic homogeneity, I still I still think that ultimately the individualist ontology of liberalism regardless of if it's if it starts out with with a uh, with the christian morality um and with ethnic cohesion i think the the ontology of liberalism is inevitably going to metastasize into something more sinister and is ultimately going to destroy uh those more traditional social formations which may exist alongside it like re religion or ethnic cohesion yeah, and that's actually what my uh, my Lies of the Enlightenment series is all about. But I think that uh, this is probably a good place to call it because we're all, we've been going almost an hour and a half. But uh, it's been an interesting conversation. So uh, any any last words before we finish, Keith? Uh, no, I just ask people to subscribe to me on YouTube, Keith Woods, and if you're on Twitter, you can follow me, uh, Keith Woods YT. It's my username. Yeah, uh, his Twitter and his YouTube are linked down below. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everyone, uh, and I will speak to you all later. Have a good night.